Little Plum, Chapter 4, by Rumor Godden. I'm going to spring clean the dollhouse from top to bottom, said Nona, one wintry afternoon when the children could not go out. It isn't spring, said Belinda. I mean clean it thoroughly, said Nona, and before Belinda could argue about anything else, Nona ran out of the playroom and upstairs to her own room. Because it was such a dark, dismal afternoon, she turned on the light. She forgot to draw the curtains. In Japan, houses are more simple and empty than ours. Walls are usually paper screens called shoji that slide backwards and forward to let in the light or to make doors and windows. The floors are covered with matting and Japanese people do not often use chairs but have cushions to sit on. They have a low table or two and a warm charcoal stove or firebox sunk in the floor round which all the family gathers. In the chief room is a niche called the tokonoma which has one picture hanging in it, a picture on a scroll that is changed to match the seasons. In winter, snowflakes perhaps, in the spring, perhaps blossom. In summer, a peony or a spray of morning glory or a bird. In autumn, maple leaves that have turned red or yellow. A Japanese garden is part of the house with trees and stones, perhaps a stone lantern, perhaps a curved bridge over a stream. Often the bridges are so curved they make a half hoop or crescent moon. Nona's dollhouse was a dollhouse like that, a Japanese dollhouse. Tom had made it for her, and it must be the only one in England, she often said proudly. It was raised on a plinth that had a flight of steps leading up to it. The walls were wooden with paper lattices that, in the front of the house, opened out into a pair of windows, while at the back they were miniature shoji. Tom had made the screens for the shoji slide in the smallest possible grooves so that when they slid back the house could be open to the garden. The lattices were of narrow strips of stiff white paper that crisscrossed. There was only one room in the dollhouse, but a hall led off of it, divided by sliding screens of pale green paper. Japanese people call a hall the shoes off place. And Miss Happiness and Miss Flower kept their tiny clogs there. The floor was covered with matting. It was really a straw luncheon mat. There was a cupboard that was really a roll top pencil box standing on its side, being a Japanese pencil box, a mountain, Fujiyama was painted on its rollers. In it, in the daytime, the doll's bed quilts and pillows were kept, and on its top were dollhouse-sized books and tiny bowls and platters. There was a firebox the size of a matchbox in which a bulb under red paper made a warm glow, a low table on which was a teapot and tea bowls, and beside it, cushions in red and blue. The lamp was a cotton reel with the bulb fixed in its hole and painted paper shades, and the dolls had a dollhouse television set. At the end of the room was the dollhouse Tokonoma, painted in pale green with a polished black wood floor, and in it Nona always kept a scroll, a three-inch long slip of paper with a shaved match end, each end to weigh it. On this winter day, the scroll picture was of snowflakes and bamboo painted on a brown paper. In a tiny yellow vase, Nona arranged green pine needles and a single winter jasmine flower. The dollhouse garden lay behind the house it had a looking glass stream bridged with a half moon wooden bridge that Tom had carved. There was a stone lantern too that Nona had modeled in clay and fired in the school kiln being up to date. The lantern was fitted with an electric bulb and could be switched on with the house lamp. Best of all, the garden had miniature trees, real ones growing in its earth, a nine inch high cedar and an even smaller willow tree. They had been given to Nona by Mr. Twilfit when the dollhouse garden was made. The Christmas presents she had liked best were some real miniature irises, not three inches high. They will really flower in the summer, said Nona. Now she was arranging and dusting the house as she loved to do, and the dolls were helping her. Miss Happiness had on an apron over her kimono, a handkerchief tied over her black hair. Nona had given her a duster the size of a postage stamp. In the garden, Miss Flower was looking after Little Peach. Tom had made him a swing that hung from a branch of the cedar tree. Little Peach sat in it, and every now and then Nona gave it a gentle tap. It looked as if Miss Flower were really swinging him. Nona was so busy playing that she never thought of looking up, of glancing across the way. If she had, she would have seen a small, pale face pressed against the glass, fair hair falling each side of it, a book forgotten on the sill. Someone was watching every move she made. Perhaps you have been to the theater and seen a stage lighted up. When the audience sits in darkness, the stage seems to come close. Everything on it shows clearly. Jem's sitting room was in darkness, and from it, that dark winter afternoon, Nona's windowsill, the doll's house, and its garden seemed lighted like a stage. You must remember how close the two houses were. 
The ilex branches came a little across, but it was possible to look through the leaves. Miss Flower looked across and saw Jem. In her silent, dull way, she told Miss Happiness, Honorable little Miss Next Door is watching us. Miss Happiness looked too, but Nona never even glanced across the way. Jem stayed there until Matson came in, switching on the light, when she jumped and picked up the book she had forgotten and pretended she was learning her French verbs. You may wonder why, if Jem watched Nona so carefully, she always looked away when she met her or Belinda in the street, and why she never smiled. I'm afraid there was a reason. Every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon, Belinda's class at school went to the park to play netball, and when they were coming back at four o'clock, they met Jem going to her dancing lesson. They walked two and two down the road, 14 little girls, all 14 of them dressed alike in dark blue coats and berets, blue and yellow striped mufflers. This uniform made Jem seem more than ever conspicuous. She looked such a dressed up little girl in her velvet coat, white fur cap and muff, white boots. Belinda and the others had short hair or plaits or ponytails. Jem's hair flowed down her back and always beside her walked Matson, carrying her shoes, her dressing case and a shawl. That's her nanny, Belinda told the girls at school. She had told them many things about Jem. In fact, they knew all about her and each time Jem passed, 14 pairs of eyes looked her up and down and there were 14 sniggers. Presently, there began to be little flipped remarks, not loud enough for the mistress at the back to hear, but quite loud enough for Jem. Here comes the snow queen. Here comes the ballerina. Don't catch cold, will you, dear? Nanny, nanny, where's my handkerchief? Sometimes the mistress in charge of them was Mademoiselle, and she would greet Jem in French so that Jem had to answer her, and swank pot, hissed the girls, or parlez-vous français, s'il vous plaît? One of the girls had a rhyme. Jem, T.J., tall and slender, she's got legs like a crooked fender which was quite untrue. Jem's legs were perfectly straight. The only sign she gave that she had heard was that as she walked past them with that stony face, she walked faster while white patches came round her nostrils and she seemed to breathe quickly through them. Her lips held tightly together. If Mademoiselle were there, she would hurry even more. Belinda thought it funny until she told about it at home. She told it shaking with laughter, but Belinda, 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 said mother. You set them all on, said Anne. I have a good mind to report you. Fourteen against one, said Tom, you little rotters. It must have felt like whips, said Nona. Belinda felt ashamed, so much so that she began to whistle very loudly. No wonder Jem hates us. Well, I hate her, said Belinda. But it is odd when you have done something that is unfair to someone. You cannot get them out of your mind. And I do wish I could go next door, said Belinda. There are ways and ways of being disobedient. And I think Belinda knew them all. You are not to go next door, Mother had said. But if I'm in the ilex tree, said Belinda, how can I be next door? You can't get up into the ilex tree, said Nona. It's too high. Besides, the ilex tree is Tom's. The children all had their private and particular places in the garden where it was understood no other child trespassed. Anne had the old white bench half hidden under the apple trees. Now Nona had inherited it from her and often took Miss Happiness in this flower and little peach there for secret picnics. Belinda had a cave at the back of the woodshed. Tom had the ilex. For two years running, he and his friend, Stephen and Ronnie, had built a Swiss family Robinson house up in the branches. None of the others had seen it, not even Belinda. Though Belinda very often took no notice of mother or even a father, she always did what Tom told her, and you keep out, Tom had said, and Belinda kept out. But that was last year, she said now. There came a half holiday at the beginning of February, one of those still sunny February days that seem as if spring has come. The snow had melted, there were snowdrops in the garden beds, and a bee buzzed round the catkins. Belinda was in the garden quite alone. Father was, of course, at his office. Mother had taken Anne and Nona shopping, but Belinda had not wanted to go. Very well, you may stay here with Tom, Mother had said. <clears throat> Tom was in the garage where he had his carpenter's bench. He was clever at making things. It was he who had made the Japanese dollhouse for Nona, and now he was making an oak bookshelf for Mother's birthday. He was trying to get it finished and was very busy. On the Tiffany Jones' side of the hedge, all was quiet too. They were all out. Mr. Tiffany Jones was usually out all day, and Jem had gone riding. Belinda had watched her being put on the white po pony by the riding master. Then they had trotted away. Matson, in her hard gray coat, had gone off in the direction of the shops. Presently, Selwyn, looking unfamiliar in a great coat, had followed her. Miss Tiffany Jones had been driven away in the Rolls Royce. Phantom Silver Cloud, too, murmured Belinda. 
She could hear television sounds from the maid's sitting room on the other side of the house next door. That meant Cook and Eileen were watching it. The gardener was in the potting shed. There was no one to watch Belinda or hear her. And now, she thought, now. Tom, are you going to use the Ilex house this year? Tom was busy planning a, board, planning a board, and at first he could not hear her. She had to wait until he stopped to rest. This year, are you going to use the Ilex house? She asked again. The Ilex house? Asked Tom, as if he had never heard of it. Your secret house up in the Ilex that you made with Stephen and Ronnie. Oh, that, said Tom, and he asked, what do you think we are, kids? That was just what Belinda wanted to hear, and her face beamed as she asked, then can I have it, can I? If you like, said Tom indifferently, and went back to his planing. Belinda ran pell-mell off to the ilex, but Nona was quite right. When she stood close under it, the lowest branch was high out of her reach, while the house was higher up still. Looking up, she could see planks, ropes, a ladder going up into the high branches, a chair, a saucepan. It looked exciting, but how was it reached? She went back to Tom. Once more, she had to wait until he broke off from his planing. Tom, how did you get up? Up where? Up in the ilex. We made a rope ladder, said Tom feeling down the board to see if it was smooth. I saw a ladder up there, a rope ladder, lashed to the first branch. We kept it rolled up there. That's how we stopped anybody getting up. But how did you get up to, to unroll it? In her earnestness, Belinda stammered. One of us got up on the other chap's shoulders. I haven't a chap, said Belinda. Could I get on your shoulders? Would you let me? Oh, Tom, will you come? Sometime I will, said Tom. Not now, I'm busy. But I want it now, please, dear darling Tom. I'm not your dear darling Tom, said Tom. You kicked me at breakfast this morning. Look, and he showed a blue bruise on his shin. Belinda had kicked him under the table because he had laughed at her. She was sorry now. Belinda was often sorry for the things she did, but it was too late. He had already gone back to his planing. She lingered, but hop it, said Tom, and Belinda had to hop it. The garden steps were too heavy for her to carry, as, she was, as was the garden table, and if she had dragged it to the tree, it would have left telltale marks on the grass. The garden chairs were flimsy and not high enough. Then what? Belinda looked round the garden and saw where father, as soon as the snow had cleared, had begun hoeing the ground between the wallflowers and the long bed, raking the old dead leaves off. His wheelbarrow, half full of leaves, stood on the path, a big, heavy, wooden wheelbarrow. Belinda emptied the leaves on the path. It was a struggle because the barrel was almost too heavy for her to tip and get upright again. But at last she was able to wheel it round the edge of the lawn until it stood under the ilex. The barrel was steady and firm. It needed to be that because in, Belin in it, Belinda began to build a tower. The barrel was just wide enough to hold a kitchen chair, a wooden one without arms. Then she found a box in the tool shed, an oblong wooden one that had once held sherry bottles. She stood it on the chair and on top of it put a big flower pot upside down. Then she climbed into the barrel and up onto the chair. The box left only the narrowest edge of the chair seat round it almost too narrow to stand on, but Belinda steadied herself against the ilex trunk and managed to fit a foot each side of the box. Then, with a huge stretch, she got one foot up on the box itself. It wobbled a little as she stood on it, and she quickly levered herself further up against the ilex trunk and brought her other foot up to balance a foot each side of the flower pot. Now she could reach the branch with her hand and could see a tied-up bundle of rope that must be the rope ladder, but she needed to be higher to untie it. Holding on to the branch with one hand, she stepped cautiously right up onto the flower pot. It was not very safe, as she had to stand on one foot. There was no room for the other, but feeling with her toe, she found a small hollow in the bowl of the tree in which she could rest her second foot. Now she could almost stand square with her chest against the branch, and she could use both hands to untie the ladder. That was hard work. Tom's knots were firm. Her hands were small, but at last she got one side undone and was struggling with the other, when pulling at the obstinate rope, she jerked. It was a small jerk, but it was enough. The flower pot skidded away from her foot, the box shot sideways, the chair overbalanced, and crash, Belinda, flower pot, box, and chair toppled out of the wheelbarrow. The chair and the box landed with a thwack. Belinda fell on her head, hitting her eye on the wooden wheelbarrow wheel, and the flower pot bounced and caught her on the mouth. For a moment, tree, houses, sky seemed whirling round in front of her. She had a stinging pain near her eye, a hot wetness in her mouth, worse pain in her arm, and a burning in one of her knees. Ouch, said Belinda, ouch. The pain was so bad it made her feel sick, but she sat up on the grass while blood ran down her parka jacket. Exploring with her tongue, she felt something in her mouth and spat. With the blood she spat out came something small and hard and white. 
It lay on the path, and with her good eyes, she peered down at it. It was a tooth. Gosh, said Belinda in awe. There was a rent in the knee of her trousers, and through it showed a graze, dark red with swelling coming up around it. The sleeve of her parka was ripped too, and her elbow hurt. Belinda was only just eight. She could not help two tears squeezing out of her eyes, and she sniffed. She spat out more blood, then slowly, painfully, picked herself off the grass. She had thought she must go to Tom, but though the grays stung and her elbow hurt, nothing seemed to be broken. The tree and the houses were steady again. From the ilex branch, the ladder dangled, one side half freed, and I had nearly done it. Nearly, thought Belinda. She had no handkerchief. As usual, Tom would have said, but she went round the kitchen, hobbling because of her knee. Mrs. Bodger had put some dusters on the windowsill to dry, and Belinda took one to stanch her bleeding mouth. When she put her hand up to her eye, the hand came away red. She looked in the mirror. Mrs. Bodger kept over the sink, but though, though the eye was closing up, puffed and purple-looking, the cut was more like a slit and not deep enough to bleed. Ouch, ouch, said Belinda, looking at it. Her lip was swelling, too, and there was a dark gap where the tooth had been. It was altogether a piteous-looking face that gazed back at her from the mirror, and wait till mother sees my trousers and parka, thought Belinda. The thought of mother made Belinda cry a little more. What will she say? What, what, what will she? She thought, but it was no use thinking of that now. If you are obstinate, you have also to be brave. And Belinda had a drink of water to help her stop crying and limped back to the ilex tree. She put the chair back on the barrow, the box on the chair, the flower pot on the box, then painfully and much more carefully climbed up the tower again. She was not as agile now, and the pain made her clumsy. She fell twice more. Once the box gave way, but she managed to hold to the branch and drop gently onto the grass, missing the path. Once she and the tower fell right down, but this time she was wary and managed to fall on her back. It made her mouth bleed again, which hurt, and her sleeve was ripped even more, but at last the ladder hung free from the branch. She was able to climb down, and after this, if I stand on the box, only the box, I can reach the ladder easily, said Belinda. Yes, she could get up the ilex without Tom, and though it hurt to move her lip or eye, Belinda smiled. She hid the box, put the chair back in the kitchen, the flower pot back in the shed, and wheeled the barrow to where it had been left by the wallflower bed, and filled it with the leaves again as well as she could. Then, painfully, she straightened herself up. Belinda was triumphant, but she was very sore, and there was no sign of Mother, Anne, and Nona coming in. It would be a long time before Father came back from the office, and I need a grown-up, thought Belinda. Tom was not grown up. Besides, he would be cross with her. School was closed. Mrs. Bodger lived at the other end of the town, but I believe, Belinda said to herself, I believe I shall go and see Mr. Twilfit. He's so kind to Nona. Perhaps he will be kind to me. She limped to the gate. Her knee was beginning to stiffen up and hurt hideously, but she went on out into the road. Then, as she turned to go down towards the shops, she found herself face to face with Miss Tiffany Jones. Miss Tiffany Jones had just got out of the Rolls Royce. The chauffeur, his arms full of parcels, was handing her a bunch of roses. Roses in February, said Anne afterwards. But at the sight of Belinda, the roses were left almost in midair. Good gracious, said Miss Tiffany Jones. Good gracious. She looked at Belinda's face, swollen and marked with tears and blood, at her puffed lips and closed up eye, her torn parka and trousers stained with grass and blood. And good gracious, said Miss Tiffany Jones again. It's the girl from next door, miss, said the chauffeur. I know that, snapped Miss Tiffany Jones. She seems to be hurt, miss, shouldn't we? But Miss Tiffany Jones cut him short. You have been fighting, she said to Belinda. Belinda was offended. She was eight years old and knew perfectly well the girls should not fight. Not with fists, Tom had taught her, or kicking. Belinda pulled people's hair. Sometimes she had been known to pinch and scratch, Tom would have said. A year ago, she might have kicked a table. She had kicked Tom that morning, but she would not have been in a fight that hurt people like this. You have been fighting, she said. Just playing, said Belinda. Playing, said Miss Tiffany Jones. Well, I sincerely hope you can find that kind of playing to your own garden. We will see that she does. It was Mother's voice. She, Anne, and Nona had come up behind them, and in a moment, Belinda was sobbing against Mother's coat. A cool, clean handkerchief was in her hand, and Mother's cool, careful fingers were examining the cut eye, the swollen lip, while Anne tenderly looked at the grazed knee. Nor did Mother say one word about Belinda's clothes. She merely said, Good afternoon, Miss Tiffany Jones. I advise you to get your doctor, said Miss Tiffany Jones. Her voice sounded as if she were speaking to Mother 20 yards off instead of being just beside her. That cut looks dirty to me. You should certainly get the doctor. 
I think I can deal with it, said Mother quietly. Come, Anne and Nona, and she led Belinda indoors. Soon Belinda was tucked up in bed, her cuts washed and dressed, her eye covered with ointment. Anne brought her a special supper on a tray, a bowl of soup, a roll of crusty bread, a private pat of butter, a plate of orange jelly, all laid on a pretty green cloth with a little vase of snowdrops. Belinda, leaning back on her pillows, felt a heroine. End of chapter four.